Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our four-part webinar series, Fundamentals of Connection Design, presented by Brad Davis. Today is October 30th, 2019. I am Nate Goner with AISC, and I am your moderator for today's presentation. I would like to welcome back our speaker, Dr. Brad Davis. Dr. Davis is an Associate Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Kentucky, where he is responsible for all steel design coursework and has received excellence in teaching awards. He earned his PhD from Virginia Tech and has eight years of experience in building design. As the owner of Davis Structural Engineering, he provides consulting services for structural vibration, steel connections, and advanced steel design applications. He has SE and PE licenses in approximately a dozen states. Dr. Davis is a member of the AISC Committee on Manuals and Textbooks and a consultant for the AISC Steel Solutions Center. He has published approximately two dozen journal and conference papers on vibration and has presented a number of continuing education courses on the topics of vibrations and steel connections. Brad? Thanks for being here today, and I'll now hand it off to you. Okay, thanks, Nate, and thank you all for attending our uh, session this afternoon. You can see how, how this uh, session fits into our schedule. This is the second of, second of four uh, sessions. Okay, Fundamental Concepts Part 2. Our topic today will be eccentrically loaded, bolted, and welded connections directly loaded uh, tension connections, we'll, we will do a uh, complete uh, example for a light bracing connection. We'll change gears to compression connections and cover beam bearing plate design and column base plate design. Okay, so let's start with eccentrically loaded bolted and welded connections. So often we have connections such as these bracket plates that have a load that is off-center from the bolt group in this case or weld group in this case over here. So we need to have some way to determine the design strength. For comparison with P sub U, the required strength using L or FE load combinations so that we can evaluate or design this connection. Okay, so we have two options. Uh, one's called the elastic or vector method. This is the traditional older method. And then we have what's called the instantaneous center of rotation method, which is an, an ultimate strength method. Okay, for bolts, the elastic method is carried out as shown on this slide. Uh, the original problem is divided into two problems. In the first, we have the load at the, at the centroid of the bolt group, and then the second problem only has the torsional moment. We use mechanics of materials methods to calculate the bolt forces and move from there to design the connection or determine the strength. Okay, we use ve vector summations uh, in this process, so this is sometimes called the vector method. This method is pretty simple. Uh, the downside is, is, is that its predictions range from conservative to very conservative. Our other option is called the instantaneous center of rotation method. And in this method, we use the, in, the instantaneous center of rotation uh, to, help with, to help with the geometry. And we use the bolt nonlinear load deflection curves. And we calculate the ultimate strength of the connection. This is a more rational method that provides better predictions, but it's, it has some fairly tedious and long calculations. So for that reason, in the AISC manual, in the AISC manual, there are design aids, such as this table 7-7. These, these are in part 7 of the manual. And with these, the design strength is this coefficient C that we get from the table down here times the shear strength of one bolt. Notice the lowercase r that we use to in indicate the strength of one bolt. Okay, so to use this table, you just go in here. Or first, you, you find the table with the right, number, right, columns, right numbers of columns of bolts. And then you go find the right vertical spacing. And also, there's different tables for different horizontal spacing. So you find the right table. You basically, basically go in here and uh, for, for the right number of uh, bolts in a row, 
and eccentricity, you pick off the C coefficient in here, and that's pretty much all there is to it. So, so it's a pretty simple process. Let's look at, at an example. In this case, we want to calculate the design strength for, this, for, for the bolt group for this bracket plate connection shown on the right. You can see we have eight 3 quarter inch diameter grade A325 bolts in single shear. The spacing is 3 inches both directions. And the load is vertical, and it's applied at, at, at an eccentricity of 8 inches from the centroid of the bolt group. Okay, so our strength is, is going to be this, just the coefficient C times the strength of one bolt. Okay, so we, we go to our design aid, table 7-7, with an angle of 0 because the load is vertical, and with the, with the correct eccentricity and four rows of bolts. And this is what we see. You can see the number of bolts controls the left-right alignment in the table. The eccentricity controls the vertical. Note we have the right spacing. And we just pick off the C value, or C coefficient. 2.93 in this case. So take that back to our calculations. There it is. So the, the only other thing we really need to do is go determine the strength of one bolt in single shear. So we go. the fastest way to do that is, man, is in the, the manual table 7-1. We go in there for a 3 quarter inch diameter grade A325 bolt in single shear. And this is the design strength of one, one of those bolts. So we just multiply C times that, and we get the design strength, 52.4 kips. And it really is just as simple as that. Okay, so moving on uh, to eccentrically loaded welded uh, connections. To determine the strength of this weld group, uh, C-shaped in this case with the load that's off-center, we again, for the elastic method, divide this into two problems, one with the load centered you know, at the centroid of the weld group, and then another one with the torsional moment. We use mechanics of materials principles to determine the forces in the welds, and then we use the vector summations to get the um, overall forces in the welds, and then go from there. And again, this is a pretty easy process. The, the, the downside is, it, is, the, is that the results range from conservative to very conservative. So just like for bolts, we, we can also use the instantaneous center of rotation method. And it's the same idea as for bolts. We, have, we use the instantaneous center of rotation to, to help with the geometry. And we use the um, load versus deflection curve for the, for, the, for the welds. And we determine the ultimate strength of the weld group. It's a rational method that gives good predictions. The downside, of course, is there's lots of tedious and fairly lengthy calculations. So in the AISC manual, there are, there's, there's a group of design aids uh, to help with this. And here's one of them, table 8-8. -8. And you go in, go in there and find the, the, table, or the table that has the weld, that's, the weld group that, that's the shape of ours. And the strength, the nominal strength, is the coefficient C times the electro strength coefficient C1 times D, which is the number of sixteenths in the weld size, times L, which in this case is the length of the vertical weld. Okay, so the process is fairly simple. Um, the, the weld in this case is L tall by KL wide. So we can determine K immediately. From K, we, we determine the X, the X factor down here. Uh, K controls the horizontal alignment in the table, so we, we can get X. X times L gives us the centroid location. From there, we get the eccentricity, uh, E sub X, which is equal to A times L, so we, now we know what A is. A controls the vertical alignment in the table. Once we know K and A, we can, can determine C. That's, mo that's most of the work in this method. Okay, C1 is from table 8-3, and it's, it's a function of the weld material uh, strength. C1 is 1 for 70 KSI welds. Okay, so let's do an example. In, the, in this case, we have this C-shaped weld group. Uh, we have 5 16 inch fillet welds, 8 inches for the vertical weld length, 6 inches for the horizontal weld length, and the load P is vertical, and it's 14 inches away from the vertical weld. So we want to calculate the strength of this using, using our design aids. 
Okay, so we translate our problem over to the, prob to the nomenclature of the tables. So lowercase l is 8 inches. K times L is 6 inches. We're eventually going to work our way around from here to X to here, to, to, to this A, and once we have K and A, we can get C. Okay, so we, we know what KL is, 6 inches, so we know that K is 0 0.75. So we run over to the table, 8-8. -8. You see that K, for K of 0.75, the X is, using an interpolation, is 0 0.225. So we bring that back, and we can determine the centroid location, 0.225 times 8, or 1.8 inches. So now we know that the centroid is 1.8 inches from, from the vertical weld. So now we can, can continue on towards getting A. Okay, so bring, bring it over here. There's our 1.8 inches to the centroid. Now we can determine E, which is just going to be 6 plus 8 minus 1.8, so here, and set the equal to A times L, and determine A. And A is 1.53. Now we go back to our table. Okay, so back to our table. We have K of 0.75, that controls the horizontal alignment in the table, and then A is 1.53, so our C is between these four uh, so we interpolate in two directions and determine that C is 1.59. Okay, so we have C is 1.59. Now let's determine the, the, the remaining parameters and the strength. So we have 5 16 inch welds, so that means D is 5. We have 70 KSI electrodes, so C1 is 1. So plugging all this stuff into our equation, we get the design strength of the weld group, and it's 47.7 kips. So you see, this is a fairly simple method. There's a couple of steps there, but it's, it's really not a big deal. And there's lots of these tables in there you, you know, for various shapes of welds. Okay, let's change gears to directly loaded connections, such as the one shown on this slide. Uh, this, this is a, these are pretty common in, in buildings, and more importantly for us, they are very, very good for, for demonstrating the various limit states and the concept of load path so that they're, they're a very good teaching tool. Okay, so what are the applicable limit states for a connection like shown here? Uh, well, we, we're, we have tensile yielding, tensile rupture. We're going to have block shear. Shear transfer, which is our new, newly explained limit state. That's a com that's combined bearing tear out and bolt rupture. We have a new concept called the Whitmore section that we're going to deal with for the plate only. Then we have weld rupture, and if we knew more about the support, we, we, we would probably have some support limit states. Like, for example, if this gusset plate was, was connected to a column flange, we're, pro we're, go we're going to have a web, web local yielding of the column. For all of the limit states, our evaluation criterion is that the required force from LRFD load combinations can't exceed the design strength. Now, the weakest one of the limit states controls the design. Okay, so let's, let's talk about these limit states one by one. So let's start with the easiest one, tensile yielding. For the strength for this, of this limit state, we go to the specification section D2 in the member design section, or J4.1 for connected parts, and the, and the same equations are there. Very simply, the design strength is phi times the yield stress times the gross area. Now this is a ductile limit state, so phi is 0.9. Note this is really a member limit state, but it's a very good warm-up for connection design, so we'll, we will typically start with that. Okay, moving on to tensile ruptures, a lot more going on here. We go to the same spec sections, though, and we, and we see the same, um, same thing in D2 and J4.1. Here, the design strength is phi times the tensile strength times A sub E, and A sub E is the effective net area. Now, the, the idea behind this, this limit state is that we have rupture along this line here at the bolt, at, at the bolt hole. We have stress concentrations there, so we're, we're, if we're going to have rupture, we're going to have it there. Phi is 0.75 because this is a non-ductile limit state. 
in many, many times when we're, when we're calculating the tensile rupture strength, the elements have what we call shear lag. So the effective net area will have a coefficient called the shear lag factor in there to take that into account. So the effective net, net area is just the net area times the shear lag factor. Okay, so let's talk about the shear lag factor. That's the hardest part. Okay, uh, you get the shear lag factor from table D3.1. And we'll, there's, there's eight, there are eight entries in this table. We'll, we'll talk about, like, I guess, three of them here. First, case one, we just don't have any shear lag, so, so, shear, so U is, is 1.0. If we have tension members where the load is transmitted to all of the cross-sectional cross -sectional elements, so all the elements are connected, except for some exceptions there. And then case two is the, is the big one that we talk about a lot for shear lag. That, that's for cases like, like this angle or, or a T like this where not all of the elements are connected. Only some of the elements are connected, usually one in these examples. Okay, so we have an equation there for, for you. Part four, or case four, is, is, the, is the other one we'll talk about. And that, that would be like if you, a, if you have a plate or an angle, say here, and it, it's connected by longitudinal welds along there. This is a new case. So we'll, we'll spend some time on two and four. Let's go to two. Okay, so imagine we have a, a, an, an, an angle like this. And it's, it has the load, the axial load T. And out in, the, out in the section or out in the member, the stress is uniform over both legs. So we have T divided by the gross area and that's the stress, just P over A type stresses. This angle is, is only connected at the bottom flat, at the bottom leg, though the vertical leg is not connected. So somewhere starting about here, the load in the in the vertical leg has to flow down to get out of the vertical leg and down to the bottom of this angle to get through the interface to the other connect, connected part. Now this creates a complicated stress distribution around here, so that reduces the tensile rupture strength. Now, if you think about it, the longer this length is, the less, the less severe that situation is, so that's helpful. So the longer L is, that's better. Second, the resultant of this force over here in the member is at the centroid, and it had to move all the way down to the bottom of the section. So the farther that has to move, the, the more severe the, the, the um, condition is. So this, this centroidal dimension x bar is the, the other key variable. So our equation that we have is u equals 1 minus x bar divided by L. It's a little bit tricky to come up with x bar in some cases, so let, let's talk about a couple of these. Okay, so we go to the commentary and find some pictures. Uh, here's one uh, of a W shape that is connected only at the flanges. The web is not connected. If the web was connected, then, then U would be one. Okay, but it's not. In, in this case, the, the stresses that are in the web out in the member have to flow, like, like the stresses in the top half of the web have to flow up to the top of the section to get to the interface with the other connected part. And likewise, down here at the bottom. So in this case, we treat this W shape like two WTs. So X bar in this case would be the distance from the top of the section down to the centroid of the WT. Another example, say we had a channel that's only connected at the web. Well, if it was connected at, at the flanges also, U would be one, but if, it, if it's only connected at the web, then X bar would be the distance from the interface with the other element over to the centroid. Okay, so that's case, that's case number, number two. Okay, let's talk about case number four. This one applies if you had something like, if you had a plate or if you had an angle, say, that's welded to another connected part with a couple of longitudinal welds. Okay, so if this is an angle, the X bar distance is out of plane of this figure. It's coming out of this. So we have the same term here for the out of plane effects, but then we have this term, or this, this factor, for, you know, that takes into account how wide this is, which is the wider is worse. And, and in the length. Okay, so um, we, we have di just this equation that we use for this scenario. Okay, one thing that happens here frequently is that we'll have a plate that has equal, equal, e equal length welds. 
So x bar here is 0. And then this, just this L is just the same, so there's L. And this breaks down to just this factor right here. So, so U is only this factor right there. So that's, that's sort of a common, uh, sort of simplified case for, for case 4. There are, are other cases in Table D 3.1, so we just have to go in there and follow, follow the directions as closely as we can. Okay, uh, we still need to nail down the net area. Uh, now the net area is simply the net area on this failure plane there. So it's the area along this line and this line. The only trick to this is that we need to subtract, subtract out the effective area of the bolt. Now what, what that means is that we take the diameter in this calculation as the whole diameter plus another sixteenth. And that is per the spec section B4.3B. Okay, so there's one thing we have to, to remember. The other thing is that sometimes we have staggers to in, in, in the bolts. So we need to be, to be ready to deal with that when it happens. So let's see what's going on with the staggers. Okay, imagine we have um, this case up here where we have the staggered bolt. So this, al al along this failure plane, this line is a little longer and it, it's at an angle. This is going to, the, the presence of the stagger adds a little bit of strength. So we have this term up here that's from the specification section B4.3B that we add in there. Now, sometimes we have more than one. So we have two here, for, for example. That's why we have a, have a summation in the equation back here, the, the summation. So you'll add one, one of these terms for every staggered line that you have. Like, like you have one, one for this case and two for here, because we have two staggered lines there. This is, this is a very, very old provision uh, in the specification. I've been told it's probably the oldest. Okay, uh, next limit states, block shear. Uh, for the strength of this, we go to the specification J4.3. The idea here is that we have a combined tension and shear failure mode. Like if, if, we, if we have a plate like, like so, we've had a chunk of the plate that's just block sheared out. So we have tension on this transverse line there and then we have shear along these two lines. And the way we do this in the AISC specification is, is we take the minimum of the shear yield or shear rupture along these longitudinal lines. Okay, here's a picture of a lab specimen that, has, that, that failed by block shear. And, and as, as you can see, we have a tensile rupture failure there, and we have a shear failure along these two longitudinal lines. Okay, so to, find, to calculate the strength of this, we go to the section, section J4.3, equation J4-5, and it, it looks like this. We have the shear rupture strength plus the tensile rupture strength, and, and we add them, but that can't exceed the shear yielding strength plus the tensile rupture strength. Okay, I think it's easier to think about this as I've shown down here. So R sub n, the, the nominal strength, is the minimum of shear rupture or shear yielding, and then plus the tensile rupture. So in, in symb symbolic form, it's like this. We have 0.6 times F sub u, the shear rupture stress, times the net area subject to shear, or we have 0.6 times F y, that's the shear yield stress, times the gross area subject to shear. And of course, these are along this line that's in shear. Okay, and then we have the uh, use of BS, which, which, will, will, which is always one for di directly loaded connections, times the tensile stress times the net area subject to tension, which is just the area from the edge of the bolt down to there in this case, from the edge of the bolt to the toe of the angle in that case. Okay, so let's, let's look at a quick example of how, how, how we jug juggle these numbers. Say we've calculated these areas, A sub N V, net area subject to shear, gross area subject to shear, net area subject to tension. And in our case, UBS is one, and we have A36 steel. Okay, so it shakes out like this. So we go 0.6 times the, the tensile stress, or ten, tensile strength times the net area subject to shear, and we get 88 kips. For, and this is shear rupture. For shear yielding, we have 0.6 times 36 times the gross area subject to shear, and that's 78.3. So this one controls. So we, we bring it down here. 
the shear yielding controls. We add to that the tensile rupture uh, strength, and in this case we get 45.3 kips. Add those, we get 124, apply the feed factor, and the design strength is 92.7 kips. So that's how we mix these, these areas and, and terms up to get the strength. Okay, block shear also applies to welded connections. In this example, we have a smaller plate that's lapped onto a larger plate, and, 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 and we have a fillet weld along this line and along this line down here, and it's subjected to a tensile load. Now, we have, for this larger plate, we have two block shear patterns that we have to check. The, the, the weaker one controls, we, we would say. So in this, first, in this first case, we have shear along these two longitudinal lines, there and there, and then we have tension along this transverse line over here. And we would cal calculate the strength P sub n for that. Case two is similar, the shear areas are the same, but now we have two tensile areas, one here and one down here. So the weaker of these would, 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 would control for block shear. Now note there's no holes in, in, the, in the plate here, so the net area subject to shear equals the gross area subject to shear. Okay, next, we also sometimes have plate compression. So it's worth, it's worth spending a little, little time on that. Say we have the lows going the other way. Now we have this little region, region of the plate over here that's in compression. And it can yield or buckle if it's slender enough. The acceptance criterion from section J4.4 is that this required load can't exceed the design strength VPN, and V is 0.9. Okay, so the specification makes it pretty easy on us in this case because of this. If the embrace length divided by the radius of gyration does not exceed 25, then the strength is just the yield strength. You, you just take Fy times the gross area, and that's the design strength, or times phi, and, and that's the design strength. In unusual cases, if it's skinny enough, then buckling would control, and we would go to, to chapter E and calculate the flexural buckling strength. Okay, the only trick to this is what do you use for, for L sub C? That's going to be K times L, and we need to be able to, to pin down what to use for the effective length factor, and there's lots of different things that can happen there. So I would just refer you to Design Guide 29, which has uh, a lot of examples of different K values. And also, there's a, there's a couple of tricks to, to establishing the length as well, L. So go in there, there's lot, lots of examples, and you'll see what to do with that. Okay, um, Whitmore section. Oftentimes we have situations like shown here. We have, in this case, a, a single or double angle coming in in tension or compression, and the plate's pretty big transverse to the, to, to the load. Now if you think about this, the plate about right here probably doesn't even know anything is going on as far as this load goes, and way down here too. The, the plate right behind the, the connection is, is, is getting hammered, and there's where all the high stresses are. Okay, so we're, we want to check tensile yielding, tensile rupture, or compression just considering the material in this critical section right here. So we need some way to determine how wide that critical section is transverse to the load. Okay, so we, for this, it's pretty easy. We go to, to page 9-4 of the manual, and we use what's called the Whitmore section. And that is simply, over the length of the connection, you spread the load at, at 30 degrees, get to the back of the, of the connection, and whatever this length here is, that's the length of the Whitmore section, and then we use that to calculate the strength. And this, this picture is obviously for a welded connection. Here's a, here's a picture of a, a specimen accidentally failed at the Whitmore section. This is a, this is a, T, uh, a, a, a T hanger type connect, connection test. And we, we, then there's a stiffener here, but at the end of the stiffener, there's a failure right there. You notice way over here, the plate doesn't even know anything is going on. So it fails right there. So we definitely want, definitely want to check this in, in our calculations. Okay, for bolted connections, uh, same, same, the same idea applies. In this case, you go from the center line of the bolts, the outermost bolts, spread the load at 30 degrees, and whatever section that encompasses, that's the critical section. 
we would not 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 include the the material the material right there in the strength calculation. Note 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 one more time. This applies for tension or compression. Sometimes, uh, if the plate's not very tall or wide transverse to the load, and the and the the, the connection is pretty long, if you spread this at 30 degrees, it runs off the plate before you get to the last or to the end of the connection. In this case, just the plate width itself controls, and we would just say the Whitmore section doesn't control. So then we just use the, the plate just, just regularly to define the critical section. Okay, so with that, let's do, a, do an example for a light bracing connection, which is a, a directly loaded tension connection. In this case, our objective is to determine the design strength, PTN, and we have a, some double angles. We have double angle four by three and a half by one quarter long leg back to back. So they're arranged like so. And they're bolted with three bolts, three quarter inch uh, a, grade A325 end bolts to a five eighths inch plate. That plate tapers from seven inches to five inches, and you see some dimensions along uh, this line right here. Now, and finally, we have a 5 16 inch fillet welds to the support. Now, we don't know what the support is, so we'll stop the calculations once we get to the weld. All right, so let's, let's track down our limit states along the load path. So if we start way over here on the right. I'm going to envision, I'm, I'm going to sort of visualize the load going from in the angle, traveling through the connection all the way to the support and then pick off the limitates along the way that would apply at the different locations. So at one, this is angle tensile yielding. Okay, move, move over to two at this bolt hole, we have angle tensile rupture with shear lag because the outstanding legs are not connected. Line three, this L shape like this, there's block, angle block shear. Now we have four, our shear transfer between the angles and plate. That's a combined limit state with with angle bearing and tear out, bolt shear rupture, and then plate bearing and tear out. So you see we bridge the gap over to the plate now. Now in the, in the plate we have plate tensile rupture and plate tensile yielding, and finally we have a weld rupture along line seven. So we just need to go down these one at a time and calculate the strength. Okay, angle tensile yielding, this is our warm up. We've looked up the gross area for the double angles, 3.64 square inches. It's our equation from the spec. We have phi of 0.9 because this is one of these ductile limit states with a strength that's easy to predict, times the yield stress, 36 KSI in this case, times the gross area, so we have 118 kips. All right, so there's one down. Just keep marching our way through the load path. Moving over to the next line, angle tensile rupture. And here we're envisioning a rupture through this last bolt hole on the right. Okay, so our equation for the design strength is phi times the tensile strength of the, of the material times the effective net area. Now in this case we have shear lag because the outstanding legs are not connected, so we have the shear lag factor times the net area. Okay, so let's calculate the net area. The net area is just the area through these angles at this hole. All right, so we start with the gross area and we knock out the area just at this hole, so it's a quarter inch thick for the angle material, but then we have, to, and then we have the D dimension transverse to the load, and that's going to be three quarters of an inch for the bolt diameter, plus a sixteenth to get to the standard hole, plus another sixteenth to get to the effective hole diameter. So there's why we got two, two one sixteenths added in there. So the effective hole diameter is seven eighths of an inch for a three quarter inch bolt in a standard hole. 7 eighths of an inch is the effective hole diameter. Then we have two angles. We have one on the near side, one of these holes coming out on the near, on the near side, and one on, one on the far side. Okay, so the net area is 3.2 square inches. Now we move to get the shear lag factor, and, it's, and we use case number two. So we have one minus x bar. Now x bar is uh, a property of the angles. It, it, it's going to be the distance. Um, along the x-axis to the centroid from the, back, from the back of the angle. Now, we look this up in table 1-7, and in this case, because it's long leg back-to-back, x-bar from the table 
is the same as x bar in our equation. If it's short leg back to back, then y bar from the table would be x bar in our equation. But here is x bar is x bar. So we plug that in, we get 0 0.85. So essentially we have a 15% reduction in the strength due to the, due to the shear lag effect. Plug all of our numbers in, and we get 118 kips. Now we got one, 118 on the previous slide, but that's just round off. It's, it's not always going to end up like that. Okay, moving to block shear. The trick here is obviously to come up with these areas. Uh, let's start with the gross area subject to shear. And that's the gross area along this line, to, from the center of this bolt to the end of the angle in this case. So seven and a quarter is the length. Note we ignore we always ignore the bolt holes, the, the bolt holes that are coming out when we're doing a, a gross area for a for a yielding calculation. So seven and a quarter times a quarter inch for the angles, and we have two angles. So this is 3.63 square inches. Net area subject to shear is along the same line, but now we are taking out these holes. We're taking out an effective hole diameter, 7 eighths, here, here, and half a one here. So we got 2.5 coming out times a quarter inch times two angles, so we got 2.53 square inches. Now net area subject to tension, that's the area from the edge of this hole, the effective hole, down to the toe of the angle. So that's two inches minus a half of one effective hole diameter. Okay, so then times a quarter inch thick times two angles, and there's our net area subject to tension. Okay, angle block shear. Uh, let's con continue through this. Okay, so um, our strength is going to be the minimum of shear rupture and shear yield plus the tensile rupture. Okay, so we, we plug our numbers in that we got from our previous slide. This is our shear rupture strength. 0.6 times 58 is our shear rupture stress in, in, in KSI times the net area subject to shear, 2.53. So we get 88 kips for that. Next, we have the shear yield. So we have the shear yield stress, 0.6 times FY, 36, times the gross area subject to shear, 3.63. We get 78.3 for that. Okay, so then we have our uh, tensile rupture strength over here. So we bring the 78.3 down. This is 45.3 coming down. Apply the fee factor, and the design strength for angle block shear is 92.7 kips. Okay, so um, next we're the, the next thing on our, on our list is shear transfer between the angles and the plate. Okay, so as we explained last time, this is a, this is a I would say, newly explained lim limit state, or newly explained way to handle bearing, tear out, and bolt shear rupture. You can read about this a little bit in the specification, section J3.6 in the user note, and also in the 14th edition manual, section J3.10, there's a larger user note there. Okay, so um, here's the method. We're, we're, we're going to calculate the effective strength at each bolt. And in, in this case, it's, it's going to be the minimum of the angle bearing strength, angle tear out strength, bolt shear rupture strength, plate bearing strength, and plate tear out strength. So we have the bearing and tear out strength of each, connect, each connected part and bolt shear rupture. And the minimum of those is the effective strength at each bolt. We're going to determine all of those and then add them to get the strength for this limit state. Okay, so let's um, identify these bolts as bolt A, B, and C. And we'll just kind of zip through these pretty quickly because we, we've seen this a couple of times by now. So for angle bearing, let's start with that. Uh, in this case, let's just highlight what bolt or what diameter we use. For, ang for the bearing checks, we use the bolt diameter in this case, 3 quarters of an inch. So using our spec equation, we get the nominal strength, lowercase r indicating a per bolt strength, 52.2 kips. And that's the same at all three of these holes. The bearing strength is not a, fact, is, is not a function of edge distances and all that. So this is the same strength at all three bolts. Okay, angle tear out strength, 
this is going to be different for bolt A versus B and C. Now here's why. Bolt A is tearing out the end of the angle. Bolt B or C, if they tear out, they're tearing out between the holes. Okay, so the LC dimension is different uh, for A versus B and C. Okay, so as we're calculating our LC dimension, that, that's the length of the shear plane parallel to the load. We use a nominal hole diameter. Now this is a nominal hole diameter. So for a, for a three quarter inch bolt, standard hole, the nominal hole diameter is 13 sixteenths of an inch. Note the nomenclature. We call this just D for the bolt diameter, D sub H for the hole diameter, and we have D sub, D sub H primed for the effective hole diameter like, like on the previous slides for the shear rupture, or sh block shear and, and that tensile rupture. Okay, now for bolt A, tearing out the end, the nominal strength is 29.4 kips. For both B and C, they're tearing out between the holes, and the strength is 76.1 kips. And those are obviously per bolt strengths. Okay, moving on to bolt shear rupture. This is obviously, obviously going to be the same at all three of the bolts. Here we have three quarter inch diameter grade A325N bolts in double shear. So the fastest way to de determine the strength of one of these bolts is to go to table 7 1, go in there for this condition, a three quarter inch in double shear, A325N, and we pick off that the design strength of one, one of these bolts is 35.8 kips. We want just the nominal strength to be comparable to the other uh, strengths we're checking all around this. So we want, to, we want to divide by fee to get the nominal strength per bolt, 47.7 kips. Okay, moving over, over to the plate. The plate bearing strength is the same at all three bolts, 65.3 kips. The plate tear out, now in this case it's a little bit different because bolt C is the one tearing out the end and A and B are tearing out between the holes. So A and B are the ones that are the same here. So for bolts A and B, and again, this uses the nominal hole diameter parallel to the load. Like if we had a slot, it'd be, you know, we have different, different dimensions in two different directions. So it's parallel to the load is the dimension of the bolt we're at, or hole we're after. So for bolts A and B, the tear out strength is 95.1 kips per bolt. For bolt C, it's tearing out the end, 30, 36.8 kips for that bolt. Okay, so we need to gather all these up and see what controls at each bolt and then go from there. So we, we want to, I'm going to line them up like this. So, I, so the effective strength is the minimum of the bolt rupture, angle bearing, angle tear out, plate bearing, and plate tear out. This is just the way I lay this out. Help, it, 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 it helps me keep, keep this organized. There's other, there's other ways to do this, obviously. Let's go to bolt A. We line all these strengths up and we see 29.4 kips controls. That's angle tear out. So at bolt A, it's going to, if it fails, it's going to fail by the angle by, by this bolt tearing out the end of the angle. Okay, moving to bolt B. Line all these up, and you see that um, the bolt shear rupture controls at bolt B. So the bolt's controlling at bolt B. You go to C, gather all of these strengths, and you see that plate tear out controls. So plate, so the bolt's tearing out the end of the plate at C. So if we were to have one, have this in the lab and load it up, we would expect to see it fail with this, with bolt A tearing out the end of the, end of the angles, while B, B is failing in shear rupture of the bolt, while C is tearing out the end of the end of the plate. That's what we, we, we would that's what we, we would hope or, or expect to see happen. Okay, so we gather these up, add them, apply the feed factor and we get the strength for this limit state for the whole connection. So, eight, eight, so this is capital T, indicating this is the strength of the entire connection, capital T there, capital T there, T sub u. Okay, so 85.4 kips. Okay, so now we've gotten the load out of the angles, through the bolts, into the plate. Okay, next, uh, plate tensile rupture. Okay, okay, so we have a Whitmore uh, section considerations here. Uh, okay, so let's let's start with the definition. Though um, we need the effective net area, 
which is in, in general it's the u, the, the shear lag factor u times the net area a sub n. Now in this case u is 1. This is one of these case 1 in table D3.1. We just don't have any shear lag in this case. Okay, now Whitmore section. Over the length of the bolt, or the length of this bolt group, we spread the load at 30 degrees. And in, th in this case, the plate's narrow enough transverse to the load that this runs off the edge of the plate. That means that just the, just the plate itself from this spot right here down to here, that's the critical section. So we would say the Whitmore section doesn't control. So our key, the width of our critical section is 6.48 inches. Okay, so our net area is 6.48 minus one effective hole diameter there. We have one of those. And though we have 7 eighths there, that's the effective hole diameter. I call that DH prime sometimes. Times the thickness of the plate, 5 eighths. So the net area is 3.50 square inches. Now, take, take it to our equation. Uh, we have phi 0.75. Again, this, this is one of these non-ductile limit states times the tensile strength of the, of the material, times u of 1 for the U factor, and then the, the net area, and then we get 152 kips for this. Okay, so now we know that's not controlling. Okay, going to plate yielding, same deal. We need to first determine what's the critical section. Does the Whitmore section control or not? And it doesn't, because the, the Whitmore section would be 6.93 inches wide. But we, don't, but we only have 6.48 inches wide of plate there at the last bolt. Okay, so the gross area is 6.48 inches times 5 eighths of an inch, which is the plate thickness. No, we don't take out anything for the hole here. We just, we just don't do that for yielding checks. Okay, so plugging that in, in our equation, our design strength is 131 kips. Okay, the last limit state we have is weld rupture. And in this case, uh, we need, needed to determine how, how long is the weld length that we should use. Now, imagine that this plate is really tall up and down the, up and down the page, which you know, transverse to the load. I'm probably going to, just per my judgment, um, take the Whitmore 30 degree spread and see where it intersects up here. And I'm probably not going to use weld that's outside of that. Now, in this case, this is not an issue because the, at the 30 degree spread, it goes off the plate. So I'm going to use the entire 7 inch long uh, length of the wells there. Okay, so the length of the wells is 7 inches. So we have 5 16 inch wells. So let's, let's, let's go use our shortcut number we came up with before last time. That's 1.392 kips per 16th of size of weld per inch of length of weld. Now that was for a theta of zero. Note this has this problem has a theta of nine, 90 degrees. If the load is perpendicular to the weld longitudinal axis. So we have a 1.5 factor in here to take that into account. The weld is 50% stronger when it's loaded at 90 degrees than when it's loaded at zero degrees. Okay, so we have the 1.5 factor there. D is the number of 16 so We have five of those. The weld is seven inches long, and we have two of them. So we have 146 kips is the strength of the weld. So that's our last limit state, so we can summarize. Note if we had, again, if we had, if we knew what the, the support was, we, we, would, we would, would be checking some limit states there also. Okay, so our, our design strength of this is the weakest of all the, all the limit states. 85.4 kips is the weakest link in the chain. And the shear transfer controlled. Okay, so let's change directions now to um, to beam bearing plates. So we're, we're moving to, to compression connections, and the first one will, will be beam bearing plates. Now, oftentimes we have situations like shown on the right where our beam is supported by a concrete or a masonry wall, and we have a bearing plate in here to, to spread the load uniformly. Okay, so what are our limit states? First, we have at this location, approximately, we have beam web local yielding. Also, at, at approximately this, this location, we can have beam web local crippling. Then here we have the 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 the, the bending of the bearing plate, kind of bending up like like a U shape in the, in in this picture. 
And then finally we have concrete crushing. These are our applicable limit states in this case. Okay, so uh, beam web local yielding. So, so let's take a look at um, this, that this limit state, which is really easy to explain. With this load being applied like so, we have a vertical, comp a vertical compressive stress field in the web. And if we, if we have too high of a stress there, we can start squashing the material at this location, squashing it ver vertically. Now, the critical section for, the, for this limit state will be, as you're going up higher, it gets, the, the critical section is at where, where the web starts. That's at the, at the K distance up from the bottom. Now, you see the critical section in this picture over here, in the elevation view. Now, we're assuming the length of the critical section is the bearing length plus some more. And this, the rest of this is defined by this line, which is at a two and a half horizontal to one vertical slope. So the length here, overall, of the critical section is LB plus 2.5 K. And the most strength we, we can have for this would be FY times the thickness of the web times the length of this um, critical section. Okay, so looking in the spec, uh, our equations are like this. So um, if, we have a, if, if our load is at the end of the member, which is defined as within D from the end, we only have this 2.5 to 1 slope going, going one way. So here's our equation, um, F, Fy of the web times the web thickness times this, bearing, times this critical section length in, in, in parentheses. Okay, if the load is far from the end of the member, then we have the 2.5 on both directions on this side and over here, so now we have 5 there. Now note in these calculations, this K, we have a K dimension, in, we have two K dimensions in table 1-1, a K design and a K detailing. The K design is the one we want to use here. It's the smaller number, a decimal number, not the fractional number. Okay. This one states one of, the, one of the rare ones that has a fee of 1.0. Okay, beam web local crippling. In this case, this vertical compression in the web causes the web to buckle like this. We get the strength for this, for this limit state from the spec section J10.3, fees 0.75. And we have three different, different equations, and we must determine which one applies. First, if the, load, if the load is applied at D over 2 or farther from the end, this equation applies. And you see it's just got the web thickness, the depth, flange thickness, some material properties, basics, and the bearing length there, and this Q, Q, Q sub F factor. Now Q sub F is just one. For wide flange shapes, it can be other than one for HSS shapes. So this, is, this, is what, this is the equation we use if the load is applied far from the end of the, of the member. Okay, if it's not, then we have two equations, and we need to determine which applies. And it depends on the LB divided by D ratio. If that's less than or equal to 0.2, we use this equation, which is just the, the equation from the previous slide divided by 2. Otherwise, we use this equation, which has this additional little factor in there. So we just have, these are somewhat lengthy, lengthy equations, but they're, they're, they're not too bad. Okay, concrete crushing. For this, we go to spec section J8. The fee is only 0.65 here because of the high, much higher variability of concrete than we're used to for steel. We have two things that, that can happen here. If the bearing area covers the concrete support, then we only get to use 0.85 times F prime C times the bearing plate area A1. Obviously, 0.85 F prime C is, is a, a quantity we see all, all over the place in ACI literature. Okay, otherwise, we have the same strength here, but we have a, 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 an increase in the strength, the square root A2 over A1. That's, a, that, that's accounting for the concrete around this plate that, that's helping the concrete right under the, under the plate. Now, this expression is limited. It can't ever have, or this, this square root here can't ever exceed 2. So you can see 0.85 times 2, this, it's the upper limit there. That means if your A2 is more than four times A1, then you don't get any further increases. Okay, so what are A1 and A2? That's the hard part here, so let's, let's dig into those. Okay, A1 simple. We, we go from simple to more difficult. A1 is measured 
it's, it's, it's basically just the base plate area or bearing plate area. That's A1. It's just a loaded area A1. It's measured right at the bottom of the plate. Now for A2, we're, we're going to spread the load at 2 to 1 in both orthogonal directions, both in the plane here and out of plane in this figure. Now when, when, whenever this, this hits the edge of the concrete, which is here in this case, that's as deep as you can go for A2. And A2 is measured on this plane. So in plan, what, what you see is this. You're spreading the load, or you're, you're, you're spreading A1 equally left, left, right, and up and down on, on this figure until you can't spread it anymore. You, you hit the edge of the concrete. Now, in this case, it hits the edge of the concrete on the right. And this dimension we'll call E. Because we're spreading it at the same slope both directions, E is the same here, and here, and up here. Okay, so that's how we get A2. Note that these lines are, are at 45 degrees with this model of having a 2 to 1 slope in both directions. Okay, next is plate bending. Um, our design model for, for, for the concrete crushing is that the stress under the plate, the pressure is approximately uniform. It was, it's exactly uniform in the equations, but we, we know it's approximate in, in reality. We need, we need a way to, have the, to know that the plate is thick enough so that it, it will approximately uniformly spread the load. Now, the, this is really a stiffness problem, but we don't want to tackle that. So we, we, we have a design model that is treating this as a bending problem. And here's, here's what we do. We're going to have a, a uniform pressure under the plate uh, that we're going to calculate. And we're, go we're going to treat this bearing plate like a little cantilever beam that goes from the, from the K distance over, over to the edge of the plate. So it's in long. So we have, we have a little cantilevered plate problem like this. Note for this K dimension, we use a K design again. Now in plan view, you see it like this. Here's the length of the cantilever. Okay, so let's, let, let's derive the, the required plate thickness. And, and to make this easier, let's use a one inch width of plate. Okay, so here's our little cantilever. You see the length in, and the pressure underneath is R sub U divided by A1. That's the, re the required pressure. And so we have a moment over here, M sub U. The moment is just going to be W sub U in kips per inch times N squared over 2. And the W sub U is F sub P U K S I times, times the 1 inch width times N squared over 2. Okay, now here's our section. We have a 1 inch wide strip by T deep. So our strength, this is a weak axis bending problem. So we have um, the, the required, or the design strength phi M N is phi times M P, which is F Y times Z X. And you see that the plastic section modulus Z is one inch is the one inch width times T squared divided by four. Okay, so our, our criterion is this: M sub U can't exceed phi M N. And phi is 0.9. Note this is we got a couple of phi factors flo floating around here. We got, we got to keep it straight. Phi is 0.9 here because this is a bending. Okay, so let's do it this way. Let's set. Okay, so here's our criterion. Let's modify it a little bit by saying M sub U equals the minimum phi M N. And just set the equations on the previous slide, these two at the bottom, set them equal to each other and solve for t. Now we're, we're going to get this. The, the minimum t is, is the equation shown right here. Okay, so you see it's very straightforward. And note again, phi is 0.9. Okay, let's do an example. In this case, we have our, our steel beam on a, on a bearing plate that's centered on the wall. The required reaction is 80 kips. The wall is eight inches, eight, eight, eight inches thick. We have A36 material, concrete's three KSI. Our objectives are first, determine whether or not the five inch dimension is adequate, determine the required plate width transverse to the beam, and finally de determine the required plate thickness. Okay, so our beam is a W18 by 76. And so we go to table 1-1 and pick off these, these dimensions. And all these are basic. I will mention one more time, the K dimension, we're picking off the design value. Note that the design decimal value is quite a bit smaller than the detailing fractional value. So we, we want the smaller one for these calculations. 
smaller is worse for our calculations. Okay, uh, we also go get our, our yield stress 50 KSI. Okay, so uh, let's start going through our limit states. Um, our dimension 5 inches here will be adequate if web local yielding and web lo local crippling are satisfactory. Okay, so let's start with web local yielding. We have our looked up properties here. Now we go to our equation. We pick the we pick the version that's for the load at the end of the member. Note that we're assuming that the, the, the criti criti critical section is 5 inches long over to here, and then it goes over a little ways further at a two two and a half to one spread or slope on this from the edge of this plate. That's why we have 2.5 there. Okay, so we plug numbers in. We got phi of one. Note we have the web thickness there, 2.5 there. Just cranking this out, we get 164 kips. That exceed that exceeds the required load or reaction, 80 kips. So this limit state is okay. Okay, moving on to web crippling, web local crippling. This is one of these cases where the load is at the end. It's within D over 2 of the end of the member. So then we need to determine which one of equations J10-5 A or B, which one applies. So we calculate the LB over D ratio. It's 5 over 18.2 in this case. 0.27, that exceeds 0.2. That tells us to use equation B. Okay, so we grab that equation. Now we note that this is the one that has the larger factor here, or has the factor with two terms in here. Okay, so we go in here and plug, plug, and plug all these numbers in, and just trying to see if there's anything noteworthy there. Note the Q is 1. I just didn't, didn't even show it over here. The strength for this, this limit state is 118 kips. Punch that, punch that through your calculator three times. Take what you get twice. That's 118 kips. Okay, so that exceeds the, the required reaction, 80 kips. So this limit state is okay too. That's the only, these two are, the web local yielding and crippling are the, the two that could tell us that the 5-inch bearing length is no good, but both of them are okay. So therefore, our 5-inch bearing length is adequate. Okay, now let's start, start working on the second objective, determining the width of the plate. Okay, so first off, I, I just want to come up with a trial width based on how wide the flange is. So the flange is 11 inches wide. Just to have a little, have the plate a little bigger, I'll have it an inch here, an inch down here. So let's try a 13-inch plate. Just give that a shot. Okay, so that will be inadequate if concrete crushing is no good. So let's let's go ahead and check concrete crushing. Now we know um, the the total size of the plate. We know the D dimension parallel to the beam is five inches, transverse is 13 inches. So remember A1, that's the, air, that's the actual loaded area. That's the plate area itself. So that's 5 times 13, or 65 square inches. A2, we, we determine it. This is obviously the hard part. We, we start with A1, spread it in both, both orthogonal directions, left, right, and up and down on our figure until we get to the edge of the concrete. Now this plate is centered. So A1 is centered. So we hit the edge of the concrete on both faces at the same time, both, both faces of the wall, this face over here and this face over here. So this is one and a half inches, and one and a half inches over here. Now, with our model of assuming we have a, this, one, this two to one spread both directions or orthogonally, we also have one and a half inches up here and over here, transverse to the beam. So that means our A2 then is 8 inches in the small dimension. That's the, that's the entire wall thickness. And 16 the other way, transverse to the beam. And note this, with this method we're using, we're spreading the load. These lines are at 45 degrees. Okay, so A2 is 128 square inches. Now A2 over A1 is nowhere near 4 times. So we, we, we know this expression controls, not the one with the 1.7 over here. Okay, so we grab this equation, plug in, plug, plug in all, all our values. Phi is 0.65 because, again, we have high vari variability with concrete, so we have a low phi factor. 0.85 F prime C A1 and square root A2 over A1. So we get 151 kips. 
that greatly, greatly exceeds the 80 kips, so it's okay. So at, at this point, we, we know we can use the, these plan dimensions, 5 inches parallel to the beam and 13 inches transverse to the beam. Okay, moving on to plate bending. Our plate has a yield stress of 36 KSI. Our uniform pressure, you know, where we're assuming it's uniform, is the required reaction 80 kips divided by A1, or 1.23 KSI. The length of our cantilever in is B over 2 minus K, and it's K design. So that comes out to be 5.42 inches. Now we have everything we need to, to plug into our minimum thickness equation. So we plug these numbers in. I think the only way you could trip up here is to get the wrong phi in there. We have phi for bending of the plate. That's 0.9. Okay, so the minimum thickness is 1.49 inches. So now we can say use, and now we know everything about the plate. Use a plate one and a half, one and a half by five by one foot one inch. Okay, so that's not too bad. Okay, let's move, move on to column base plates, um, so, such as this one. Okay, first, concrete crushing. Pretty cool. It's exactly the same as, as, as we just covered for the beam bearing plates. If anything, this is a little easier because these are, us these are very often square. The plates are very often square, so A1 and A2 are a little easier to, to, to determine a, a lot of times. Okay, so that, that's easy enough. So let's move on to plate bending. Okay, we have the same idea here. The assumption is that, or the design model is that the pressure is uniform under the plate. We know it's not exactly true, but we need to have the plate thick enough so that's approximately true. You can see here we're calc calculating the pressure underneath as if it's exactly true. The required pressure is, there is the required reaction divided by B and N. B is the base plate dimension this way and N is the other way. This is A1, by the way. Okay, so we have this uniform pressure. So the plate has to be thick enough to make that approximately reality. Now here's what we're going to do. Rather than tackle the stiffness problem, we're going to treat this as a bending problem. But it's a little harder than that because this is a two-way bending problem. So we're going to break it down further into two one-way bending problems. First, we're going to break it down as a cantilever that goes from approximately the flange center line to the edge of the plate this way. The length of that cantilever we're going to call M. Now we determine that from N and 0.95D. Okay. The other direction is a little softer, so we have 0.8B sub F there. But in, in, in the other direction, we have, a can, we have a cantilever length that goes this way. And, is, is, and the, 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 the traditional symbol for that is N. And we, we determine that from B and 0.8B sub F. Now we calculate M and N. And for, for this step right here, let's say let's call that M prime is the max of the two. That's the, the max is, 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 is going to control. From that, we can use the exact same method we use for beam bearing plates and calculate the minimum thickness using, the, using this equation. And again, one more time, phi is 0.9 right here. I have to stop for a second, though. What happens if, what's your team in if M and N are really small? You, you, you know, say they're really small, and, and from this equation, you get a 16, 1 16th of an inch. That's obviously not reasonable. What happens there? So let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Well, every now and then you have, a, you have base plates like this. You have very lightly loaded base plates that are barely bigger than the column. These are common in metal building system uh, base plates. In this case, the bearing area is this shaded area in here, and the plate needs to be thick enough um, so, that we have a, so, so that we have this uh, be okay for a concrete crushing. Now, the pressure over here will be very small might even lift up a hair, like in a lab test. The plate may even lift up just a little bit from the, from the concrete. Now, using this model, um, this is what's in the manual in, in part 14. So uh, now we have, instead of having M primed with M and N, we have a third cantilever length, lambda N primed. And in this case, uh, we just have some equations for lambda and M primed. We have this lambda, which is a function of uppercase x, which is given by this equation down here. Notice, notice it's a little strange looking because there's a load in there. And the strength for con concrete crushing is also in there. So it's kind of, kind of neat looking because of that. It's a little different than most other, most other equations for strength. So we have x from here, plug it in here to get lambda. 
in primed is just a function of the depth of the beam and the flange width. Once we have M, N, and lambda N prime, take the max of the three, that's lowercase l, and here's our, plate, our, our minimum plate thickness. Note that for regular proportioned base plates, lambda N prime will, will never control. But it's, note that this is there. You'll see this eventually, probably. Okay, now with that, let's do an example. In this case, we, we want to evaluate the base plate. We have a W10 by 33 column. The required load is 250 kips. The base plate is 1.5 inches thick by 18 by 1 foot 6, and it's 836. The concrete pedestal is 24 inches square, and it's made of 3 KSI concrete. And in this case, we just note the plate is centered on the pedestal. So this, is, so this, this column is concentric with the pedestal. So let's, let's go about the business of evaluating this base plate. Okay, let's start with, with concrete crushing. Uh, A1 is just the base plate area itself. A2, going back to our method we used before, is we take A1, which is square, and spread it equally in all directions until it hits the edges of the concrete. Now in this case, these little round parts of the, of the concrete, we're going to kind of ignore those. Pretend like that's just square. And we get 576 square inches for A2. Okay, now here's, here's our equation for the, for the design strength for concrete crushing. And I'm going to leave, th leave this here just to demonstrate the use of this second term. Plug our numbers in. We got 0.65 for phi, 0.85 times F prime C times A1. Now we have this incre increase from the square root of A2 over A1. That gives us 716 kips. Okay, let's go, let's go through, through the numbers for the second one. Second expression, 0.65, 1.7. This is wrong. It, there should not be a 0.85 there. Mark, mark that out on your handouts. Mark out those are your 0.85. 3 KSI concrete and 324 square inches. The second expression gives us 913 uh, kips. The minimum of the two controls, so it's 716 kips. Now that, that exceeds the required force, P sub U, 250 kips. So concrete crushing is okay, or it, we, we should say the concrete crushing limit state is okay. Okay, moving on to plate bending. Um, our M and N dimensions we determine from, from over here. Uh, 0.95D is 9.24 inches this way. That leaves an M just from, from subtracting is 4.38 inches. N, similarly, is 5.82 inches. Note that for square base plates and more or less square columns, N is practically always going to be bigger than M because this 0.8 versus the 0.95. Okay, so N is controlling so far, and we, and we know this is going to control overall, but just to, to demonstrate, let's, let's go ahead and, and calculate lambda N prime. So N primed is, just from our calculations here, 2.2 .2 inches. X, just plugging these, these numbers in, we get 0 0.346. Now, taking x over to calculate lambda, 0 0.650. Note that can't exceed 1. It doesn't. Now, lambda n primed is 1.43 inches. So now, the, the, the controlling cantilever length, L, is the max of the 3. And n controls. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, the uh, required pressure, we're, we're assuming a uniform pressure, P sub u divided by A1, which is B times n. And that's 0 0.772 KSI. Okay, um, taking, taking that, that to our equation. And note, by the way, this equation is in uh, part 14 of the manual near, near the front of part 14. It's a little different form, but it's the same thing. Plug our numbers in. The only trick here, I guess, is the V factor again, 0.9. We calculate 1.27 inches. We're providing 1.5. So that's so the we, we are providing more than the minimum, so it's okay. At this point, we know everything's okay. Uh, the plate one and a half by eighteen by one foot six, eight thirty six is okay. It checks out. Okay, that's the end of session two. Thank you all very much for being here and uh, and for your attention. 
Uh, next up will be um, next next Wednesday, Shear Connections Part One, and you can see our topics on this slide. So with that, um, back to you, Nate. All right. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we will be getting to some questions that we've been fielding from the audience, but we will, as we did last week, start with a couple of polling questions for the audience to see if they were paying attention. So the first question is as follows. It's a true or false statement. True or false, the tables from Part 7 and Part 8 of the manual used for analyzing eccentric connections make use of the elastic method. Is that true or false? You can select the answer you think is correct on your computer screens. The tables from Part 7 and Part 8 of the manual used for analyzing eccentric connections make use of the elastic method. Is that true or false? All right, so the answers look like they're slowing down here. Brad, I'll go ahead and close it. And it looks like we have about 60% think that that is false, and 40% believe that to be true. What was the right answer we are looking for here? Well, the, the majority is correct. The, the design aids in Part 7 and 8 for eccentrically loaded connections or well groups or bolt groups they use the instantaneous center of rotation method, which is the ultimate strength method. Uh, we, we're not using the elastic method because it's overly conservative. And you know, once you have these, these design aids in place, the sort of extensive calculations that are required for the instantaneous center method are, are irrelevant. So we, we just want to use it because it's more rational and more accurate and not overly conservative. So instantaneous center method, not elastic method. All right, let's try another one. Question is, which of the following limit states makes use of the Whitmore section? Is that A, compressive yielding, B, tensile rupture, C, tensile yielding, or is it D, all of the above? Again, which of the following limit states makes use of the Whitmore section? All right, answers are slowing down. We'll go ahead and look at the results. And it looks like about 67% of the attendees think that that answer is D. Did they get that one correct? Yes. Uh, when we're checking the, the plate, uh, the, the Whitmore section is used to, to define the critical section for all three of those. Uh, compressive yielding, tensile rupture, uh, tensile yielding. Uh, you can see that in, in the AISC design examples and in Design Guide 29. All right. Well, good job on that one, everyone. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to some of the questions that we received from the audience. And the first question will bring us to this uh, topic of shear lag factor. Um, and I've got a couple questions on this, so we're going to ask it in two parts. Uh, what would your approach be if you were connecting to the flanges of the channel and that that's one. And then the other question is, what would what if you're you are only connecting to one of the flanges of the channel? Okay, let's start with the first question. Um, in if if I was only connecting to the flan to, to to or if I was connecting to both flanges only, then I would treat the channel just like that top picture with with the W shape. In in that case, we would have the um, we have like an L shape. 
at the you know for the top half of the section and the L shape at the bottom, you'd have to you would have to calculate the centroidal location or the, the elevation in this picture of the centroid of that the half of the channel, the top or bottom half. And 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 the distance from the top of the, say the say say the top edge of the section down to the centroid of that top half, that would be X bar. Okay, now if you're if you are connecting to one one um, one flange only, the problem is a lot more complicated. Now the the connection is not symmetrical about the centroid of the section. So now we have bending that's caused there. So in that case, we obviously have a, a combined uh, axial and bending problem for the the beam or for for the for, for the member itself. Now for the connection. For the connection, what what do we do with that? I would probably have to do something conservative there, and just take the the flange plus maybe a little piece of the web or something. I would I would have, I would have to go research that. I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever seen that. I'm sure it does happen at some point, but as far as a tension member that that the channel with only one of the flanges connected, I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, so, I, so unless I could find an example somewhere, I, I would just take take the flange that's connected. Uh, might take a little part of the web, but I've, my first step would be go go look and see see if I can find find something for that. I've never seen something for that though. All right. Looking at the beam web local yielding. Um, I guess this would apply to other local limit states where you use the, the K dimension. And the question is, for beam web local yielding on a built-up plate girder, what value of K is used for determining the web yielding capacity? My default would be to be conservative and just use the flange thickness. I would go go try to find an example somewhere to see if I might consider using the fillet weld between the web and flange. Um, yeah, that that I would do one one or the other. I guess if if I'm in a big enough hurry, I, I'm just going to use the flange thickness for that. Uh, if I'm in little little trouble getting getting it to work, I'm going to go see if I can find justification for using the fillet weld also. And then, and then the K dimension. In that case, the K dimension would 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 be from the bottom bottom of the flange up to the top of the fillet weld. All right. So keeping a question right here, um, it's a question about in a detail like this. Wouldn't you want to have stiffeners at the end of the beam? And I would imagine that's for lateral torsional buckling situation. Um, and then, how might your analysis of of this um, bearing plate differ if you were to have a stiffener involved? If I have a stiffener in there, conservatively we can use, we, we can just use the same approach. Conservatively conservatively we, we can do that. So I would I would probably go with with, with that approach. All right. Um, let's move ahead a couple of slides. Um, to so there is some questions about the bearing areas A2 and A1, and one question was: Is there a practical limit of A2 if the base plate is not near the concrete flange? And I guess I'd also maybe go to these equations as well on that question. Okay. Yes, there there is a, practi a practical limit on what you use for A2. That would be the second term in that bottom equation there in in the spec equation J8-2. You can see that if if A2 is four times A1, then the square root of A2 over A1 is is two. And you take the two times the 0.85 over there, and, and you get the 1.7. So if if the A2 is huge, you know, say say it's 
tw- you know, 20 times larger than, than A1, you're, then you, you're just going to end up with that second, that, that second expression controlling in, in the equation J8-2. All right. Let's move to slide 67. This is a bearing plate calculation. So the question is, is there a way that you could use the bottom flange of the beam, the thickness of the bottom flange of the beam in addition to the thickness of the of the bearing plate in this calculation? For instance, if you you weld the bottom flange of the beam to the uh, bearing plate. Well, you could try that. Uh, note that these, uh, th- th- this methodology comes from the manual, not the specification. The specification provisions are required. We have to follow those because they are, they are adopted by the building code. This method that we're, that we're showing here is, is what's in part 14 of the, ma- part 14 of the manual. So you could certainly do something else if you if you wanted to. Um, just typically, we, we we try to follow this sort of um, I guess, for lack of a better term, pseudo standard approaches that have, you know everyone else is using. We 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 we've been using them forever. So I'm probably not going to do that if I really need to uh, account for the flange there. I, I know I'm kind of getting outside of what people typically do, so I'm getting getting a little little nervous there. But you, you but you certainly could. You certainly could do that. All right. Um, slide 82. So there was a question of what if you have a situation where A1 is too large? And what this question asker is getting at is what if your A1 is impractically large to the point where you could not spread the stress out that far to your, the entire area of the bearing plate? What would so a, what would occur there? A one is too large. Yes. I don't think I understand the question. Um, a one is too large. Does that, does that mean you can't you can't come up with a plate thick enough? So you know, the, if 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 A one is very very large, then the moment arm you know in is 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 is, is going to be very large. Um. I, I guess I just don't. I guess I just don't understand the question well enough to know what to do with it. I mean, there's if 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 he means that it's just such such a large end dimension that you can't come up with a plate that thick. Um, I'm not sure what to say. I'm, actually, I, I guess I should, just shouldn't answer because I, I don't I don't know what the questioner means. Sorry. Right. That's okay. We'll we'll follow up there and and see if we get a we can um, home in on on the specific issue that that question asker is, is wondering about. Okay. Um, all right. Well, it looks like actually, you know, we have a f- quite a few more questions here to get to, but unfortunately we are a little bit past time. So at this point, uh, we are going to wrap up our live question and answer portion. Um, that said, if we didn't happen to get to your questions, and there were a few that we did not get to, um, we we will uh, we will be getting to those um, and work with Brad via email to answer those questions to those uh, um, question askers. So thank you for submitting those to us today.